Good morning. I'm CCL's Vice President of Government Affairs, Ben Pendergrass. I want to start by thanking Representatives Garbarino and Houlihan both for their leadership in relaunching the Climate Solutions Caucus and in focusing on the urgent need to modernize the way we permit energy infrastructure. We believe permitting reform is a vital component to building the clean energy infrastructure we know we need to lower American emissions while strengthening the American economy and producing good jobs here at home. We are very excited that this is the focus of the first Climate Solutions Caucus briefing of this Congress. We hope the caucus will play a major role in advancing this discussion. The caucus was first launched in 2016. The story goes that the idea originated with a chance meeting between a CCL volunteer and Congressman Ted Deutsch in the House cafeteria. Afterward, Congressman Deutsch approached then Representative Carlos Corbello and he agreed to be the Republican co-chair. They were soon joined by reps Ross Latham and Patrick Murphy. At the time, there really wasn't a place where bipartisan conversations were happening around climate. Also, there really were not any hearings or education on the issue taking place in Congress. It seems strange now, but at the time it was a radical concept. And for those first couple of years, meetings of the Climate Solutions Caucus were packed affairs because they really were the place where climate conversations and education were happening. In the 115th Congress, the Climate Solutions Caucus hit its largest size with 90 members, evenly divided between the two parties. It also had its first legislative victory when almost every member of the caucus joined together to defeat an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that would have blocked the Pentagon from studying the impact that climate was having on national security. We at CCL still believe the Climate Solutions Caucus has enormous value and can be a place where climate solutions and bipartisan cooperation on this pressing issue can originate. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers, Dana Nucitelli and Zan Fishman. Dana Nucitelli is CCL's research coordinator. He is an environmental scientist and a climate journalist with a master's degree in physics. He has written about climate change for numerous publications, including Skeptical Science, The Guardian, and Yale Climate Connections. He also authored the book, Climatology versus Pseudoscience, as well as 10 peer-reviewed climate studies. Zan Fishman is the Director of Energy Policy and Carbon Management at the Bipartisan Policy Center, leading their work on energy and infrastructure policy and carbon management. Prior to joining BPC, Zan worked for Congressman John Delaney, who was in fact a very active member of this caucus, he worked for Delaney for over nine years, most recently as his presidential campaign manager and chief of staff in Congress. I personally think Zan is one of the most knowledgeable people in this town permitting reform, and I think you will soon find that to be the case as well. With that, I will turn it over to Dana and Zan to give an overview of this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Climate Solutions Caucus for inviting us to this briefing and for recognizing the importance of permitting reform. I am Dana Nicitelli, a research coordinator for CCL, and I'm an environmental scientist, and I write for Yale Climate Connections as well. So let's first talk about the goals we're trying to achieve through permitting reform. Uh, we want to make the permitting process more efficient and more streamlined. Uh, crucially, we're not trying to just green light every single project. but We are trying to get to the ultimate approval or denial of the permit that final yes or no decision in a more expedient manner. Uh, that's because we want to build our energy infrastructure faster, which will have the benefits of improving the reliability, security, and affordability of our energy and our power grid. And then we're also trying to improve community involvement in the permitting process for reasons I'll discuss here in a few minutes. Uh, but first, uh, let's talk about improving the reliability of the power grid. So one challenge we're facing here is that we're seeing uh, increasing amounts of extreme weather events, be they extreme heat waves, heat domes, flooding, hurricanes, polar vortexes, uh, things that can knock power generation offline. And in some cases can also increase demand for electricity but with people dealing with extreme heat or cold. And so that combination of things uh, can lead to an increase 
in the number of power outages and blackouts, things that we want to avoid. And so one solution to that is to increase our ability to transfer electricity between regions of the country so that a neighboring region that's outside of the extreme weather event can send its extra electricity to a region that is being hit by the extreme weather to help avoid some of those blackouts. Um, so one thing you can do, because right now some regions of the country have very little ability to import electricity from the neighbors, uh, so one solution is just to require a certain uh, amount of ability to import uh, electricity between regions. And so one bill that would do that uh, is this bicameral bill with this great name, the Big Wires Act, uh, just says that each region of the country has to be able to import a certain amount of electricity from his neighbors. That doesn't solve the problem that building a lot of the transmission lines, uh, the big transmission lines between states needed to do that is a very slow process. The permitting of interstate long distance transmission lines can often take over a decade. Um, and so we also need to solve that problem. And so one way to do that is to reduce the amount of permitting needed because right now uh, interstate transmission lines require uh, permitting in each individual state that the transmission line is going to go through. And that's a lot of paperwork and red tape and bureaucracy that needs to be gone through. And so it's a very, very slow process. Uh, one alternative to that we see in interstate natural gas pipelines, which just have a one-stop shop in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, that handles the permitting for interstate natural gas pipelines, FERC consults with the individual states and localities that the uh, pipeline would go through, but they do all the permitting in-house. And so it's a much more efficient process. Uh, as a result, permitting interstate natural gas pipelines takes something like half as long as permitting interstate electrical transmission lines. And so one solution there is to just treat transmission lines, at least big important ones, similarly to how we treat these interstate natural gas pipelines, have FERC coordinate the permitting process in-house, consulting with individual states and localities, but have them do it all in one shop, once one's place. So you only need one set of uh, permitting applications. So there's less paperwork, less bureaucracy, less red tape that way. Um, so a couple of bills that, that would uh, have language to do that are Senator Manchin's Building American Energy Security Act and the CITE Act, for example. And then another stumbling block and when it comes to getting uh, electrical transmission lines permitted is a cost allocation because uh, stakeholders are often fighting over who's going to pay for how much of a big transmission line. And so one solution there is just to have FERC allocate the costs proportional to who benefits from these projects, uh, which again, there's language in Senator Manchin's Building American Energy Security Act and the CITE Act to do that. And then finally, because uh, the power grid is this big national thing that we want to improve its security and reliability, but it takes a lot of planning to how handle something so large, there have been proposals to create a dedicated office transmission, uh, office of transmission within FERC, uh, to do that sort of planning. And so the peer in charge acts, for example, have language to that effect. And then I mentioned the importance of early community involvement uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, for one thing, if you're gonna have a big energy infrastructure project built in your community, then you want to have input and have your voice heard in the permitting of that project. And the benefit of that is that that can reduce the risk of later lawsuits because if individuals or organizations feel like they weren't a part of the permitting process and the project went on without their inputs, they're more likely to bring a lawsuit and lawsuits can really extend the timelines of these projects for many, many years. And so we want to avoid them whenever possible. And so you have the, the dual benefits of giving people input on, on projects that are going to directly affect them and also reducing the risks of these extensive lawsuits down the line if you can improve the early community involvement process. Some specific proposals to do that include having federal agencies uh, in the permitting process identify a chief community engagement officer who will work uh, specifically on community engagements, also establishing community engagement funds in federal agencies, 
uh, so that they have the resources to do that. Um, so those are a couple of uh, ideas put forth by the White House. Uh, we could also allow federal agencies to require community benefits agreements, which are agreements between the project developer and the community to do some kind of uh, things that will benefit the community in the process of building the project. Uh, for example, hiring a certain number of uh, local people as workers. Uh, federal agencies have a lot of experience in helping to negotiate those agreements. Uh, and so allowing agencies to require these community benefits agreements would both benefit communities and uh, help uh, federal agencies uh, smooth out that negotiating process. Uh, so the PEER Act in the Senate is one example of a bill that has language to that effect. Uh, the PEER Act also suggests just directing federal agencies that they need to provide meaningful public involvement opportunities to make sure that they're uh, engaging the community and getting their uh, inputs in the permitting process. And then we could also provide support for these project pre-development programs, uh, which could include things like giving communities grants so that they have resources to get involved in the permitting process early on. Uh, so the LIFT Act is an example of a bill that has language to that effect. And then there are reforms to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which is the main environmental law, not the only one, but the main environmental law that uh, governs the permitting process. Uh, so these are mostly passed in the debt ceiling deal, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, they mostly came from the Builder Act in the House. Uh, so these include when there are multiple federal agencies working on the permitting of a single project, designating, designating a lead agency to make the ultimate decisions and then having the other agencies provide inputs to that lead agency uh, to make them work more efficiently together. Uh, having those agencies all work together on a single environmental document rather than each doing their own document and duplicating efforts uh, in a very inefficient way. Um, the Fiscal Responsibility Act also set time and page limits for uh, environmental assessments and environmental impact reports to make sure they're done in a timely manner. And it allowed for project applicants or more likely their contractors to draft those environmental documents, uh, which then federal agencies have to review and make sure and take responsibility for the accuracy of the, that, those documents. But allowing the applicants to draft those kind of takes some of the workload off of the federal agency's desks. And then the Fiscal Responsibility Act also started the process of creating an online permitting portal. Uh, which will add transparency so we can see where in the permitting process a given project is at a given time. Uh, so those are all generally good changes that were passed in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. One thing that was missing uh, was the establishment of some sort of process to quickly resolve disputes between federal agencies when they disagree about something in the permitting of a project. Right now, there's not a set process for them to resolve that dispute. And so you could do something as simple as just having them get together within 30 days in a meeting uh, to resolve the dispute and then expediently uh, issue that resolution soon thereafter. Um, for example, Senator Manchin's bill has some language that would do something like that. And then another issue is the statute of limitations for NEPA lawsuits, uh, which currently after a NEPA permit is granted, there is a six year window during which a lawsuit can be brought which is a very long time that creates a lot of uncertainty for project developers. And so there have been various proposals to shorten that statute of limitations to various lengths. Uh, so for example, the Restart Act in the Senate proposed two months, HR1 proposed four months, uh, Senator Manchin's Building American Energy Security Act proposed five months. Uh, there was a think tank proposal that suggested two years and the Peer Act in the Senate suggested three years. Uh, so you can see there's a wide range of proposed timelines here. So there's a deal to be had somewhere uh, in that range. You want to be careful not to shorten it too much because if an organization or group is considering bringing a lawsuit uh, against a project and they're running up against that statute of limitations limiting out, like, uh, running out, that kind of forces their hand and forces them to bring the lawsuit. Whereas if they had a little bit more time, maybe they would have decided that it wouldn't be fruitful to bring the lawsuit, and they wouldn't. Um, so you want to give enough time so that uh, organizations can make those decisions uh, without giving, making the window too long and creating too much uncertainty for project developers. Uh, so somewhere in there, there's a sweet spot that uh, Congress can negotiate. And then some other proposed permitting reform ideas. 
Uh, there is an existing program called FAST 41, uh, which is an interagency council comprised of relatively high members of each uh, federal agency that works in the permitting process that for uh, important enough uh, energy projects, they will uh, accept those and give them an expedited review. Um, and it seems to work very well. Um, and so, uh, for example, Senator Manchin's bill uh, proposed lowering the threshold to expand uh, that program to more projects. So currently projects have to have $200 million in investments to qualify for FAST 41. And Senator Manchin's Building American Energy Security Act proposed lowering that to $50 million so that some somewhat smaller projects can qualify for FAST 41 as well. Uh, we could also have federal agencies look at maps of sensitive areas, be they environmental sensitivity or other sensitivities, and then find areas of low sensitivity that would be good spots to build energy infrastructure projects, uh, call those low impact go-to areas and give those areas uh, a more expedited uh, environmental permitting process since they have already been designated as low impact. Um, so for example, the New Democrats Coalition made some proposals along those lines. We could also consider more co-benefits of projects. For example, uh, if there's been a transmission line proposed, uh, you could consider that the construction of that, that transmission line will make the grid more stable and secure. Um, maybe it'll reduce air pollution because it'll allow more clean energy to be built. Things like that. The more benefits of the project that you consider, the more likely the project is to be approved. Uh, so the Peer Act in the Senate, for example, had some language to that effect. Uh, if there has been an environmental document and review done for a project before the NEPA process began, you could allow the reuse of that same environmental document as long as the project and the site have not significantly changed in the process, just to avoid duplicative efforts. Uh, so that's something that HR1, for example, proposed uh, to allow. And then geothermal energy is interesting. Uh, there's a lot of potential for geothermal energy to supply clean, firm power and utilize what we've learned in uh, advancing drilling and fracking technologies uh, to get this clean energy. But currently, uh, geothermal exploratory drilling, uh, the permitting process is very slow, whereas oil and gas exploratory drilling has a lot of permitting exclusions that allow them allows that drilling to happen a lot more quickly. And so there have been some proposals to just give those same exclusions uh, that's already given to oil and gas drilling to geothermal drilling, put them on the same footing. Uh, so for example, HR1 and the PEER Act have proposed language to that effect. And HR1 also proposed uh, doing regular federal land lease sales specifically for geothermal projects because we have a lot of geothermal energy potential underneath federal lands in the United States. And then finally, uh, to build all this energy infrastructure, we're going to need a lot of critical minerals. And so again, the critical mineral permitting process is very slow. So there have been various proposals to improve domestic mineral exploration and development per permitting, for example, from the SPUR Act in the Senate. And there is just recently an interagency working group that issued a report to do just that as well with some suggestions as to what Congress can do. So I'll stop there and thank you for listening. Due to the way congressional briefings usually work, the actual briefing was not recorded. So if you'd like to see Zan's remarks, I would refer you to our June 2023 20, conference and the, his breakout session, Perspectives on Permanent Reform, to get a good idea of what was said in the permanent reform briefing. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.